I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. To Jesse. Jesse. Today, we bring you the latest from Yemen and reveal how another claim of Russian interference turned out to be just a hoax again. That word hoax, we use that a lot today, don't we? Sit tight. The show starts now. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. Hi, I'm Brigitte Santos. For our top story today, we turn to Yemen, home of the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe. In recent weeks, fighting has intensified between Yemen's Houthi rebels and the international Saudi-led coalition near the country's main port, Hodeida. The latest round of fighting comes despite a 2018 UN-brokered ceasefire. On Wednesday, two Americans held hostage by Houthi militants were freed as part of a U.S.-backed swap that returned 200 Houthi loyalists to the region. The civil war is now in its fifth year and has resulted in a man-made hunger crisis that's left two-thirds of the population starving. While the Houthis have worsened the suffering of Yemeni civilians, the Saudi-led U.S.-backed coalition has caused the most harm by implementing blockades on land, air and sea routes, preventing and slowing the flow of food, medicine and aid to civilians. Over the course of the war, the coalition has also indiscriminately bombed markets, homes, schools, water facilities, hospitals, mosques, and even weddings, killing thousands of innocent people. This all comes amid the global COVID-19 pandemic. The virus has sickened people in nearly every single country on earth, including Yemen. Jesse, many people forget that this war is still raging and that our government is still involved, so I wanted to talk about it today. What are your comments? And it's good that you did, Brigida, because, you know, I've been watching mainstream media all week here in the United States, and there hasn't been one word about this war going on in Yemen and our participation in it. Now, granted, they're focusing on the pandemic, they're focusing on the elections. Those are two big national, national stories. But it seems they're letting international stories just slide under the radar right now, Yemen being one of them. And I'm trying to figure out what is our dog in the fight between the Saudis and Yemen? Why do we support the Saudis? What is our undying support of them from? I mean, these guys, evidence has turned up they may well have participated in 9-11. They killed Khashoggi, the reporter, and dismembered his body. You can't trust these guys for a second. Why is the United States so much in love and in bed with Saudi Arabia? That's a question I'd like answered. Well, I'll answer it for you. Now, the civil war in Yemen is widely seen <laughs> as a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But the Houthis are not simply just a proxy of Iran. Remember, the Houthis emerged as a true regional opposition to Yemen's president in 2011 and then to his successor, his successor who fled to Saudi Arabia after the Houthis seized control of the capital in 2014. Since then, the war has been a public relations nightmare for the United States because of all the killing of civilians. Yet here we are half a decade later, and the Trump administration continues to argue that America's partnership with the kingdom helps reduce civilian killings by advising the coalition on targeting and rules of engagement. But Jesse, American-made bombs have killed non-combatants. That includes men, women, children, and seniors. So these claims, they don't hold up. The dog in the fight that America has is really about generating billions of dollars in arms to Saudi Arabia. That's what this is about. Wow. Well, and you got to figure oil must figure in there at some point. But yeah, so we sell the arms to the Saudis, which what does what? Boosts our economy. So here we go again. The United States of America, the biggest war weapons dealer on the planet, selling weapons to help sustain and create these wars. This seems like a civil war with outside interference happening in it. And we're supporting it with our weapons. Why? Because we have to sell weapons. It's the basis of our economy. You know, many people in this country tell me I should give up my weapons, and I've made this statement. I'll make it again. I'll think about giving up the weapons I have, even though none of them have ever killed a human. I'll give them up. 
the day my country ceases to be the largest weapons dealer throughout the world. They got to lead by example for me to follow it. In other news, the United Kingdom's Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, has closed her three-year investigation into improper data handling by the now-defunct British political consulting firm, Cambridge Analytica, and its parent company, SCL. Her report concludes that there is no additional evidence to support claims that the firm colluded with the Russian government to steer the results of the Brexit referendum and that the firm was not even involved in the Leave EU referendum campaign except for some initial inquiries early on. The commissioner previously handed Russian IP addresses in data associated with Alexander Kogan's server to the UK's National Crime Agency, which has not pursued any action since. To remind you, Kogan is the man who developed the app that allowed Cambridge Analytica to collect personal data on millions of Facebook users. A 2019 UK Parliament report mentioning those Russian IP addresses and Cambridge Analytica also says, quote, it has not seen evidence of successful use of disinformation by foreign actors, including Russia, to influence UK democratic processes. The UK regulars Cambridge Analytica investigation is one of the largest and most complex ever carried out by a data protection authority. Over 700 terabytes of data, 42 computers, 31 servers, and 300,000 documents were examined as part of this inquiry. And again, Jesse, we see the Russian election meddling narrative falling flat. Still, this story has not been covered much by the corporate media because the commissioner's findings are unpopular. Yeah, I'm sure that they are, because they're always pushing how much the Russians interfered in our elections here in America. Then they insinuated they infer in interfered over in Europe and all that. They maybe did a little bit, but they all do. You know, I'm going to go back again. The Carnegie Mellon Institute did a study, and they found out that between 1948 and 2010, the United States, I believe, has interfered in over 81 elections in 45 different countries. So it seems like it's the status quo out there, spy versus spy from Mad Magazine. Everybody's trying to interfere in elections. We're so upset here in the U.S. about it because the Democrats need an excuse for why Hillary lost. So they use the excuse of Russian interference. They've been banging that gong since the 2016 election. It's hollow because Russia did not interfere to the level that even affected the election. They said that from the get-go. Yet the Democrats keep banging the gong on it because they don't want to accept responsibility that they blew the election of 2016. And if they lose this next one, they'll have to find another scapegoat to blame again, rather than looking in the mirror at themselves and the campaigns they ran. You know, there's always going to be some type of interference, but just because an ad goes on TV doesn't mean it changes anybody's mind. I don't know anybody that changed their mind and voted differently because of something Russia did. Now, Commissioner Denham's investigation also concludes that Cambridge Analytica exaggerated the depth and accuracy of its user profiling techniques. During the investigation, the regulator did not find evidence to back up the company's claims that it had over 5,000 data points per individual on 230 million American adults, including those psychographics we were all told about. Nor was there any evidence that the firm used proprietary techniques or technology to profile its users. Instead, SCL and Cambridge Analytica used well-recognized processes and commonly available technology. According to the regulator's analysis, there was even a degree of skepticism within the company about the accuracy of reliability of its data processing. Cambridge Analytica's main crime here appears to have been exaggerating and overstating its capabilities, and yet we've been sold this story for three years now. Yeah, I guess what they're guilty of is something called BS. And we all know what that's <laughs> short for. They were BSing their way and providing a bunch of statistics they didn't have for whatever reason I, to influence an election, I don't know. But the point of the matter is it didn't carry any weight. It didn't truly change the election. Donald Trump won. He won more because of the, of the Electoral College 
and the falsity that is here in our country, which I've been advocating to get rid of for decades and decades, that's why he won the presidency. He lost the popular vote by near three million. But again, only in the United States presidency can you lo lose the popular vote and still win. Doesn't make sense to me. In environmental news, the Arctic is warming faster than almost anywhere on the planet, at a pace that's even faster than scientists predicted. That's according to researchers who just returned from the world's largest ever Arctic mission. Expedition leader Marcus Rex says more than 300 scientists from 20 countries have now witnessed firsthand how the Arctic Ocean is dying. Their research suggests that in the next few decades, the Arctic's icy landscape will cease to exist as we know it and that by 2030, there will be no Arctic ice in the summers. If the Arctic loses its summer ice, Earth loses its Arctic cooling system. Without it, there will be no stable, cool weather system to rely on and stamp out massive wildfires and other climate-related disasters. Jesse, what do you think about these findings? I think they're astounding. I think they're scary, and I think we ought to be fighting a war on this on the environment rather than fighting and supplying a war and money and everything to Yemen. This is going to be the stuff that kills the world. We're going to kill ourselves. Now, whether we use nuclear bombs to kill ourselves, I don't know. That's what it would, it would take in a war war to eliminate us. But I think our big problem comes from the fact of pollution and what we're doing to the, the, the world with global warming. Do they need any more proof? It's melting. What more proof do you need? These people that deny science, they are the most dangerous people on the planet. People that put religion ahead of science are the most dangerous people out here. Perennial mature ice in the far north has receded by 95 percent. But one researcher has proposed a solution to help the Arctic hold on to its ice and Earth's reflective shield. Leslie Field and her team have spent a decade engineering and testing grain-sized hollow glass microspheres that can increase reflecti reflectivity by 50 percent and help ice last 20 percent longer. The sand-sized beads float, and when released, they act as a thin reflective layer on Arctic ice. But the Arctic Ice Project needs millions of dollars in additional research and development for it to be rolled out. So, Jesse, look, what would encourage governments to spend more money on developing solutions like this rather than waiting until it's too late to dump money into cleaning up and rebuilding after these climate-related disasters? What would encourage them? I don't know. A bunch of numbskulls that run these countries of ours. I don't know what could encourage them more to get ahead of the eight ball rather than being behind the eight ball. It is ridiculous that we are not doing something, and it is ridiculous that we have a president that denies climate change, just as he denies the pandemic. He denies everything he don't want to deal with. I got news for you. This is the stuff that's going to destroy the world. It's not going to be politics between one country and another. It's not going to be elections that are contested and all that stuff. What's going to destroy the planet is our polluting and our, and our total ignorance and ignoring of global warming. For God's sakes, it's melting, people. What more proof do you need? It is melting at the North Pole. It's time for a break. When we return, the governor sits down with retired U.S. Army Major Danny Scherzen to talk about patriotic dissent. We'll be right back. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. It's my pleasure to welcome back retired U.S. Army Major Danny Scherzen, who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He joins me now to discuss his latest book, Patriotic Descent. Danny, as a veteran, what does patriotism mean to you? Well, you know, having been at sort of the pointy end of patriotism, I think that it, it has to be more than flags and symbols and pledges and all the abstraction. To me, it's about values, principles of civil rights, civil liberties, and a fierce dedication and aspiration to the nation's best self. So as a veteran specifically, it's a mission continues moment. 
lifelong service that, uh, is more valuable after the military fighting for these values of patriotism than combat duty in many cases. And I call that a participatory principled patriotism in the book. And I think that's what we have to strive for. Now, what role does dissent play in patriotism? Well, you know, in his Beyond Vietnam speech, when Martin Luther King in 1967 finally comes out against this war, he said the problem in America is that too many folks confuse or try to label dissent as disloyalty, as un-American. Uh, I would argue, as he did, that in times of crisis, and this is certainly one, pandemic, nuclear brinksmanship, climate catastrophe, hopeless and endless wars that are hurting our republic. In a time of crisis like that, uh, dissent, patriotic dissent, speaking out and standing up, saying something you know they might attack you for becomes the highest form of patriotism. And actually, especially as a veteran, I find that for me at least, anything left would be obscene. Now, there's a difference between patriotism and nationalism. For those who don't know, what's the difference between the two? Well, nationalism is an accident of birth. In its most uncritical form, it has filled millions of patriot graves. Uh, it's like a militant form of identity politics. The accidental borders I was born in make me better than another person. Uh, there's really an, a sort of unquestioned irrationality to it, and it comes in the form of these slogans, my country, right or wrong, love it or leave it. Uh, but patriotism, by contrast, uh, in its participatory bet, it asks us for more than being a cheerleader for America or Belgium or whatever country. Uh, it has obligations as well as privileges to try to make this country a beacon, both at home and abroad, that we so often style ourselves. And I've always said the country has to earn its patriotism. Let's talk about your subtitle, America in the Age of Endless War. When did the Age of Endless War begin? Well, you spoke of endless war, and I just have to say, a week ago, Stars and Stripes, which is a you know, military newspaper, ran the following headline. It said, quote, years after they fought in Afghanistan, troops watched their children deploy to the same war. I mean, that's grotesque, right? There's no historical precedent. Why is this not a national story? A major scandal on every New York Times headline uh, until it stopped. But that's my point. We're numb. We're immune to endless war. And to your question, we rarely remember how it started. I point to two points, though. One is obvious, one less so. The less obvious one is after the Soviet Union falls in 1991. This unipolar moment of triumphalism where people in Washington started to believe everything is permitted and limits are for losers. And the second one was right after 9-11, signing three days later the authorization for the use of military force. The AUMF open-ended, rubber stamped by Congress, only one person dissented, and that has allowed us to carry on endless wars without oversight, uh, without congressional approval, and the people's representatives are derelict in their duty. Now, founding father of the Constitution, James Madison, he warned that America's surest route to tyranny is the abuse of the war power. What did he mean by this? I'm so glad that you brought up Madison. Everyone always talks about the Founding Fathers on both sides, but the reality is the Founding Fathers barely ever agreed on anything. So I kind of reject this idea that to go back to the Founders. But there's one thing that they mostly all did agree on and that they worried about and that they obsessed over, and it was Rome, the curse of Rome, Rome's Republic falling into empire. How could they avoid it, they wondered. And so Washington had two options that he put forward in his farewell address. He said, one, stay out of entangling alliances. Two, beware of pretended patriots. But Madison's point is that long wars, empires, they always come home. And when they do, civil liberties are violated, patriotism is policed, and culture and society itself becomes militarized. Step out in the streets today and you'll see that at a protest. Now, how does never-ending war reflect on our government? You know, in the end, 
what happens is there's a boomerang effect. So, you know, I fought some pretty awful folks, pretty cruel terrorists, but I reject state terror as well. And so there's very little moral difference between a suicide bombing or a drone strike on a wedding party. That's the obscene stuff that goes on overseas. But at home, it reflects on warrior cop police brutality, uh, the president threatened to put troops in the streets, Patriot Act surveillance, the end of privacy. And the link to all this is that boomerang effect of war. If you carry on war overseas for too long, as Madison said, uh, your society, your republic will become extraordinarily diseased. And I think we're living in that now. Now, why don't more veterans speak out against these wars? Certainly, some must come home disillusioned. You know, I think many do, and it's underreported the number. Uh, people like to use us as political pawns, uh, both sides. But the idea is that we don't have an identity, we don't have agency. I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, it's hard. It's also scary. It's also lonely, and there's very little profit in it. Uh, for the senior veteran, they have a pecuniary and a professional interest in endless wars going on forever. The revolving door that gives them a seven-figure salary lobbying for Raytheon is not available if they speak out. But I think also there's an apathy. There is a sense of the beast, the enemy is too big. And so a lot of veterans really fall into that sense of fatalism. Uh, but the last thing is many do try to speak out. But we don't hear their voices because they are silenced or ignored by mainstream media. And that's why uh, you don't even hear the voices, because I know hundreds, if not thousands, who feel the same way as me. Their voices are not getting out there. Now, in your book, you talk about a friend of yours, Lieutenant Colonel Danny Davis, who blew the whistle on the absurdity of the Afghanistan war. What exactly did he say about his time in Iraq and, Af and Afghanistan? Look, the key thing about Danny is he is a conservative with a small state. He spent his life as a vague Republican, and he's on Fox News occasionally. This is not a hippie peacenik, uh, but he has principles and he has character. What he saw in Iraq and, and especially Afghanistan was a gap between the generals and the senior officials' public statements and what was really happening on the ground. He saw failure by every metric. It wasn't getting into the reports or the media. And he refused to say, I'm just following orders. So he wrote an 84 page missive corrective dissent that went up the chain through the army. And when nothing happened, he went public. And he published a piece called Dereliction of Duty Two, uh, where he basically argued that the generals were lying about this. As you might expect, the Pentagon was not pleased. Yeah, what did the media, the public, and the Pentagon say about Davis's allegation? Well, that's interesting. You know, uh, within the military, uh, Danny talked at an award ceremony about his fear of whether he'd even be able to finish his last two years of his career because he knew he'd be a pariah. How hard must it be to go to work every day knowing that everyone is talking behind your back, that you're not invited to the parties anymore? Uh, that's difficult. And he knew that it ended his career. He knew he would never make 06. He was okay with that. Uh, the media, though, they gave him his moment, okay, his 15 minutes of fame. Unfortunately, uh, Barack Obama was the president in this case. And so the idea was that uh, we, we don't really criticize his wars because they're not Bush's wars. So he got his 15 minutes of fame. Uh, he even got an award from a, a certain society. But then his story was ignored. The media never really engaged with his bigger systemic issues, all of which were reconfirmed you know, nine years later by the Afghanistan release, the Afghan papers from the Washington Post. But again, we're still there. And now it's the Democrats largely fighting against ending the war. Now and finally, why is dissent important for democracy? And why should people view dissent as an act of patriotism? Yeah, it's, I think it's an act of patriotism because it is a lot harder than putting a bumper sticker on your car. It's a lot harder than standing for the pledge, and it's certainly a lot harder than a Facebook like. Uh, but it is the highest form of service to question something you love. If you love a friend, you tell them when they're messed up. You tell them when they're off the rails. And so I think that it is time for us to first become a more engaged and educated citizenry, second, to become participatory and active, and finally, to tack all that towards equality, 
human dignity and some common decency and humility in our foreign and domestic policies. This is going to require some face-to-face -face interaction. COVID safe, of course, but uh, we as a country have to get together to stand so that we can do like the 80s Army commercial said, right? Be all we can be. And I mean as a society and as a nation. Yeah. Retired U.S. Army Major Danny Scherzen, thank you very much first for your service and thank you for your time and continuing to fight the good war. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Governor. Always a pleasure. The world according to Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. Thanks for watching. Send us your comments on Facebook and Twitter for a chance to be featured in next week's episode when we cover more stories ignored by the corporate media. And as always, when the government lies, the truth becomes a traitor. Stay vigilant and wear your mask. The world according to Jesse. Jesse.